Amen, brothers and sisters. Well, welcome to another night of Sundiata Sadiq. Oh, I feel so good. I feel free. I don't have to call me Walter Brooks no more. Sundiata. Sundiata identifies me with a land mass. Walter Brooks don't do nothing but identify me with my slave master. I mean, you can walk past the graveyard and my name could be on the tombstone saying Sundiata Sadiq. Somebody said, damn, that's an African land. I didn't know I had no Africans in Westchester. Let me say uh, a shout out to my sister down in Atlanta, Georgia, Professor Marcashi K. Patrick. And I want to thank you, sister, for uh, sending me the necklace. It was um, uh, beautiful. And I know you made it when you were like 15 years old and you kept it as a you know, something that you did for the first time. And I know it took uh, some kind of thing to, uh, you know, part with it. So uh, I want to thank you for that. And uh, when I come down to Atlanta, uh, you promised to take me out and um, for breakfast, get some scrambled eggs, grits, home fries, you know, the whole thing. And then we'll party the weekend. So again, Sister uh, Marquesi, I know they're working you hard down there, Sister. See, I know what they do. See, they work us just like they used to work us on a plantation, but now they pay us. But I know I know you moved from one school to another, and, um, you know, I know you're doing, doing the thing, doing the job. That's the African princess. Uh, let me thank uh, Brother Joseph Muhammad for inviting me to uh, the meeting with Minister Farrakhan and um, 200 other activists from around New York. Um, uh, I appreciate that, brother, and uh, it was inspiring. And, um, you know, one of the things that he talked about was the Million Family March. And um, at this time, which would be October 16th, so all people should be looking at that date to head toward Washington, D.C. on October 16th. In fact, you know, during the time that the minister has been traveling around the country, Mr. Farrakhan has called some of the gang members or, you know, the street organizations together. Uh, I know you had Snoop Doggy Dog and uh, Dougie Fresh and brothers trying to talk to, uh, to them about their music. <clears throat> and so there are going to be some changes made uh, on October 16th. And uh, there's going to be a political agenda set. And, uh, you know, last time it was about two million people, even though the white man was telling us it was... Uh, you know, less than a million, but I've been to uh, anti-war marches and the largest one was 650,000 and, you know, Mr. Farrakhan's Million Man March, it was twice that many, so. But see, they want to kind of take that away from us. Don't let us know our power. So let me again thank uh, Minister Joseph Muhammad. Uh, let me see. Uh, last Last uh, Sunday, I took a bus down to, from a, uh, Reverend Sharpton's uh, National Action Network about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We went down to Philadelphia to support uh, the people who were fighting uh, the, I know you saw that police uh, wilding where uh, Uncle Tom, Hankerchief head Negro police were trying to show their masters that they were just as much cop as the white ones and they were jumping up and down stomping on his brother who by the way was shot about five times in the stomach while they were stomping on him and beating him. Now witnesses say that this black man did take a car. He got out of it and tried to give up and during that time he got beat and, you know, when somebody's beating you, brother, um, you know, you're trying to uh, defend yourself. So if the brother was biting the lowlifes, um, that, you know, that's part of his self-defense. And uh, he was shot. And the other thing that's coming out now that the police that shot him also uh, had been sued by black people in Philadelphia for brutality toward black people. So this will all be coming out. But one of the interesting things while we were there, <laughs> well, the first thing that happened when we left Reverend Sharpton's um, headquarters, we had an Asian brother drive, and I believe he was Vietnamese, but most people kept calling him Chinese, and he was young, and people kept trying to tell him how to drive the bus. He's the bus driver, so they should let him drive the bus. And 
he was nervous and making funny turns and stuff like that. So when we get to Philadelphia, you know, we go past the rally and people start yelling at him. And I believe somebody called him a chink or something like that. So he chinked us all right. When we all got off the bus, you know, he went around the corner and uh, told us to get back to New York the best way we could. So uh, we were in Philadelphia to about 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we, we had to take a taxi. You, you have to see this neighborhood because there was no taxis covered. The women had to call the police so the police could get the taxis to come into the neighborhood. And we took a bus to the Greyhound station and then on to New York. So um, it was very interesting and um, shows you like the disorganization because people, I mean, you know, calling back to New York, you know, trying to find what was going on. And uh, I think sometimes you should make contingency plans. You know, if we, if we know this happens now or possibility something like this could happen, then we make some kind of contingency plans. While we were there, the church is packed. It was the Amy Zion Church. And uh, every top Negro preacher in Philadelphia and the surrounding community was there because they was having all kind of uh, TV camera coverage. They had TV helicopters in the air, three police helicopters over top of the church, pigs all over the place. And the ministers was looking their finest. They even had a, a, a procession down the aisle. And I know I heard some boos when the procession was coming. And you know how it is when a, a preacher think he on national television. Well, this one minister, he was just supposed to give the uh, like introduction prayer. Oh, brother, it was on and on and just hooping and hooping. And, you know, you know how they do. And, uh, you know, because after the thing is over, somebody said, oh, boy, you sure did preach, brother. Well, damn, he was just supposed to give the open prayer. He made a whole speech. And anyway, um, people spoke. I guess the most, the person that got the most applause was the uh, brother from the Nation of Islam, uh, the minister down there at the local Philadelphia mosque. But there was hundreds of people out in the street chanting, bring the leaders out, bring the leaders out. And they had, they forced these Negroes to come outside. First Negro to come outside was the NAACP president. He had on a big old 10 gallon straw hat. Looked like he had a jerry curl, or he might have had his hair was curly, but he had on a blue blazer. He dressed like a cop. You know how cops got them outdated uh, clothes like Chief Burton? You ever see Chief Burton's clothes? The chief of Police of Austin? I mean, he got like, like salt and pepper jacket. And not just him, but. What's the other kind? Apostolico, man. They don't know how to dress. But this is how the NAACP president was dressed, so you know he wasn't part of us. As soon as he stepped outside, the black people was going, boo, traitor, traitor. Scared him half to death, so he had to kind of retreat. Then the minister came out, the minister of the church, and they was booing him, called him a traitor. Now, we down in Philadelphia, and the crowd started chanting, we want Sharpton, we want Maddox. We want Sharpton. We want Maddox. And <clears throat> the Uncle Tom's there had to give way to uh, Sharpton and Martin Luther King Jr. And Martin Luther King Jr. tried to calm them down. So the crowd was getting tense and unruly. And the pigs, they was looking at each other like this, you know. Like, what are we going to do? Because uh, they calling their own leaders Uncle Tom's and traitors and stuff like that. So all of a sudden... We hear that's a bomb in the church. Now all the police come from all over, rope the church off, then bring one bomb squad dog in, then bring, you know, like one time I thought I had a bomb in my package, man. I had to wait, and they brought a big old truck over. A guy got out with this big old suit on and big old mask coming in the house, you know. With, so, I mean, so what kind of bomb threat was at that church when I didn't see none of the bomb squad? Plus, they didn't evacuate the people next door to the church. They just got rid of us, pushed us out the way, and roped it off with yellow tape. And uh, it might have been something to that bus leaving us down there in Philadelphia. I don't know. But uh, that's what took place. And uh, it's a shame that uh, 
these black ministers and basically when you heard their speeches uh, this stomping and beating of this brother was so outrageous that uh, they had to get involved because it was on television. Now what the pigs are saying and even the Uncle Tom Mayor, now Mayor Street, I met Mayor Street when I was down in Philadelphia years ago. He was just like a city councilman and he was saying, yeah, if I ever get elected <coughs> mayor, you know, um, I'm going to be talking about Mamiya Abu-Jamal, you know, that type of thing, brother. And, and, and you know, Street opened it up for us to uh, have our sessions in City Hall. I mean, I participated with Steve Hawkins in a big uh, meeting right there in City Hall. It was all across the street, you know. We had to make some compromises to the Fraternal Order of Police. We had to have every pig that was killed, we had to have his picture in. Uh, the city hall and we had to have it facing the panelists but you know that was alright because black police officers participated with us and told us how racist uh, the Philadelphia police was and some of the things that they were doing so um, that, that's who Street was now he's the mayor but just like Tom Cambrieri and other people and uh, Ernest McFadden and you know people like that once they get in power you know it's all over he hasn't even mentioned Mami Abu Jamal's name he was one of the Negroes you saw on TV saying, uh, I know you saw the tape, but maybe it wasn't really what you saw. Now, you got to remember what happened before the tape, see? Now, this black woman already told us what happened before the tape. She said the man raised his hands up in the air, tried to give himself up to the police, and they started beating him. And the man, you know, the last result was to jump, jump in the police car and get away. I mean, I would do the same thing. They fired 50 shots at him shot him, what, four or five times in the stomach, and then the last thing you saw was them stomping him and uh, Negroes kicking him in the head along with their white comrades. Now, it's nothing, it's nothing new about black people doing those kind of things. When we was on the plantation, Massa would get a black man and put one of them old top hats on him and give him a whip. He was like the slave driver. And he whipped you just like the white man would whip you, see? Kill you just like the white man would kill you. When they came and got Shaka Sankofa, Gary Graham, they had a special all-black prison prisoners. They got a special unit in that prison to take people out of their cell and strap them down if they're unruly. These are black prisoners. They volunteer for it. You know white folks want to get themselves all messed up, so they got these black inmates. And that's nothing new. I mean, you know, during the Holocaust, you had Jews that wanted to survive, wanted to live a few days longer. Some was up there playing violins, tricking their people, thinking they was going to take showers. Then you had some that was like uh, security. They was making sure, telling them that, you know, everything was going to be all right and walking them into the gas chambers. We got black people like that today. Got one sitting up on the Austin Village board like that, Ernest McFadden. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. So, in Philadelphia, I mean, there's gonna be marches, brothers, because that's where the Republican uh, convention is gonna be, and we're heading back down there, and if you wanna get any more information, call, call the National Action Network. You can get it probably on your uh, computer, nationalactionnetwork.org, but um, I know there's going to be a couple of marches on the district attorney's office, a female out there, Lynn Abrams, I think that's her name, and uh, we're doing a lot of stuff around uh, the Republican convention. Last night, uh, I'm trying to think of what date that was, the 26th, there was a meeting of the um, Austin Village Board to pass the resolution on the so-called civilian complaint review process of review board. Now, it's nothing new, brothers and sisters. I mean, back in 1973, when we took the police to court, we wanted them to change the rules and regulations, and uh, we forced them basically to do things. Now, let me just repeat this again because I keep saying it over and over again. Before we took the Austin police to court in the 70s, they just ran rampant over the black community. 
some cops one day beat up a um, sanitation man. And uh, by the name of Eldred Gross, stomped him halfway to death. And uh, Leon White found him in a cell having seizures and took him to the uh, hospital. But during this time, uh, I had sent some brothers down there to take a picture of him and uh, had it on my barbershop window and all these low lights and the Austin police came down about four or five cars but being as cowardly as they are they just stood outside and was telling people to get back and they just kept looking at the picture and kept looking at the picture like they was mad and stuff but black cops came forward to uh, say what had happened and what they had heard and this was like uh, during an investigation. Now Joe Burton, when I said that there was criminal activity and thuggery going on in the police department historically, from Marion up to him, he gets all upset. And he wants to get up and speak. In fact, Clay Tiffany pointed out that he had a little gold chain on his arm, which was kind of new for a police chief. So you know what Clay be talking about, that double entendre kind of stuff. Well, anyway, uh, he got up, started speaking, had an attitude, and then I came back, you know, because here you had Tom Carr, Robert Wood, Leon White, you had these black cops supposedly talk to the government about what was going on in the Austin Police Department as relates to the black community and black police officers. Somehow the government got word back to the white police officers that Robert Wood and the rest of these black police officers had said something about them. Consequently, they had like rat and different kind of stuff put on their lockers. Now, Burton, talking about his integrity and his, he's nothing but a coward, a little white boy that went along with the program. I didn't see him getting up there saying, yeah, this is what they're doing to Robert Wood. I didn't see him when Chief Murray told people, uh, cops, not to go to uh, Robert Wood's uh, testimonial to boycott it. I didn't see Joe Burton with all his righteousness. I didn't see him say anything. I didn't see him say anything about what happened to L.J. Gross, how Daddy Apostolico and them stomped him and beat him. So all that shit he was talking uh, at that meeting didn't mean nothing. And let me say this, if Clay Tiffany says there's illegal gambling going on with the Montagues, right, and they're having a big, uh, a big sports event every Super Bowl and a lot of illegal gambling and the pot is like $100,000 and up, and he got police officers taking part of it, then what is Burton all about if he knows this? You know what he does? He tells Clay Tiffany to prove it. And so when his police officer's son told me that it was all our family, Cosa Nostra, we are all a family. Well, he, he, he was, I mean, you can be Irish and be in the mafia. I mean, Gallo, when he was up in Greenhaven, he said that, um, check this out, he brought black people into the family. Crazy Joe Gallo, he brought black people into the family. So in Austin, you can have anybody in the family. I mean, I worked for a man that was in the family. Told me that his family, this is a black man now, told me his family did not use the money that the Austin detectives was picking up, uh, Joe Clark and Tommy Crowd and them. He said that his family did not use that money to bring heroin into the community. And he was confident of that. And so, although I don't believe it, because a gangster is a gangster, but he was confident about that. So anyway, you had uh, the chief talking about his integrity and stuff like that. But the biggest thing was is that here you got a Negro, Ernest McFadden. This, Ernest McFadden is a protege of Francine Vernon. Francine, I'll give you credit, sister. You know how to pick the right type of Negro that white folks can accept. That they, see, white folks, they don't feel comfortable around me or Charlie Coco or Ernest and uh, magazines, you know, they they don't they they, they stay kind of on edge. But when they get around Ernie, 
And they get around Francine, see, they, they feel comfortable. They feel like they can say things that they understand. And Ernest McFadden's that type of Negro. He was, they were so confident in him, they sent him to South Africa. Instead of him coming back, tell us about the poverty and how the white man still controls the army, the navy, the air force, the police department. That Negro came back. I don't even think he said nothing. He said, I had a good time. Went to Sun City. Did he go to Sun City? No, I don't think he went to Sun City or what. Didn't say nothing. Didn't talk about the AIDS problem. Right now, you look at the New York Times. He didn't say nothing. He could have came to the black community and said, look, black brothers, we got a sister city in South Africa, and they're suffering. And why don't tomorrow we get together and get some clothes, get some medical equipment? Or get the and Negro ain't said nothing. I heard that the South African came over here a couple of weeks ago to present the South African flag to Tom Cambrieri. And he turns around and says, give it to Ernest McFadden and somebody else. Disgrace. Well, the black man knew that Ernest was over there in Africa, but he wanted to give it to the head man in charge, Tom Cambrieri, the mayor. Now, that, see, disrespected this black ambassador, I say he's an ambassador, but this black representative of South Africa when he wanted to give him the flag. Tom Cambrieri didn't want to take the flag. I bet you that was an Italian coming over here and. Uh, Tom never been to his hometown and wanted to give him the Italian flag. He would have took that. But you got to remember now, brothers, this is the ANC it used to be a terrorist organization, according to Ronald Reagan and Tricky Dick Nixon. So maybe Tom had that in his mind. I don't know. Take no terrorist flag. Deal with no terrorists. So I heard all that stuff went down. Now, at the police community relations thing, when they were talking about the resolution, Brother Hernandez, Miguel Hernandez, made this presentation why he did not want to vote for it. Now, right next to him, you had this lap dog, Ernest McFadden, black man, born and bred in Austin. Knows all about the beatings and tortures by the Austin Police Department. Knows probably more than me. Probably, if Francine was his mentor, she probably sat down and told him, Ernie, well, that's the past. You know, we got to move along past that, you know, even though it wasn't no justice for those black people, we got to kind of move past it, because you're in a different position now. We're going into the new millennium. You might be male one day. If you play your cards right, you got them aspirations, Ernie. And Ernie start thinking, man, I'll be the first black male Austin. Shoot. And that Negro got them kind of thoughts. I can tell by the way, I can look at him and see he got them kind of thoughts. But the white folks don't have them kind of thoughts, but he has them, and he believes it. And so that's why he amen anything that Tom Cambrieri says. Tom Cambrieri bought him in the election. Now, Ernie thinks he got all them votes on his own. But people got to remember, whenever there's a black candidate sponsored by the Democrats, the black candidate gets the top vote. You had Woody Worthy, when he ran for office, he got more votes than anybody. Because Tom Cambrieri is a shrewd plantation manager. I mean, I told Tom that if you look at the videotape, I said, Tom, you sure know how to oversee this plantation. And when Woody Worthy won, it shocked Tavano. Got a black man now, tax, tax collector, treasurer. And what Tavano did, that old white man, that old white devil, he called up to the office and said, don't show Worthy how to use the computer." sabotage it. We'll teach him a lesson. And Cardoza was like struck. He didn't know what to do. He didn't know white folks would treat him like this. In fact, the man had to go to the doctor. He was about to have a nervous breakdown. Tom Cambrieri started attacking him. But with Ernest, is different. See? Ernest is a bootlicker. How are you going to be born and bred here in Austin? And here you got Miguel Hernandez that moved here and recognizes that this thing is bogus and you live here, Ernie? Where's my handkerchief? Where's that red handkerchief? Oh, that woman got it around her head over there. I'll take that handkerchief and give it to Ernest McFadden, the handkerchief head Negro of the Month Award. Now you know better. And that's why, brother, I told you at the meeting that uh, 
I was disappointed in you. And I'm sorry for you, brother. I'm really sorry for you because I don't know how you can live with yourself, you know. I don't know how, you know, you can uh, sit there and hear us talk about how Chris Malone was gunned down and uh, you vote for that thing. Here you're going to have a political... See, what it is, is no different from 1973. Still you're going to have the, the uh, commissioners or the trustees still as, as the uh, police commissioners but what you have this time is a political uh, patronage of uh, hand-picked people plus police officers that will sit on this community relations board. Now, Clay Tiffany got up and accused Randolph Scott McLaughlin of defending cop killers. Now, that's when I met Randy. He was a good lawyer then. Not that he was defending cop killers, because I don't believe these brothers shot the cops uh, without uh, provocation. So I believe what they did was defending themselves. Well, in fact, Anthony Laborde, the brother that we call uh, Abdul Majid, when he was captured, I went down to his house and brought his wife back to my house to Osman so she could stay because once I got to her house in Queens, the police had her surrounded. She had to have a bodyguard uh, at her house all night long. Her kids were all nervous. So I said, Sister Frankie, come on up to God's country. Come up to Austin. You can stay at my crib. Relax. Even leave your door open. Won't nobody come in. And if they do, there's a 357 there. You can know how to use it. See, Frankie was, you saw her picture on the front of the post. They call a gun mob for the Black Liberation, no, for the Black Panther Party. They found all these guns in the house. But, you know, um, so me and uh, Clay differed on that because that's when Randy was a good lawyer. But now I don't know what Randolph is doing. I think he's trying to make a little niche in Westchester. Going to be rich one day. He's raising his ugly head in New Rochelle. He's down there trying to sell the same kind of police community relations board. I was down there speaking a few weeks ago trying to warn the black people. I said, Randolph Scott McLaughlin's on his way. And check this out, what he's doing here in Austin. So, uh, but Ernest, you know, I mean, the African Holy Ghost will deal with you, brother. I don't know. I, I just can't understand it. Mm. Now, Tom Cambrieri thought I was making a joke when I told him that he handled, he was a good overseer. Because he is. I mean, Tom has, uh, you don't see none of the black people struggling um, around police brutality or anything else in the community because they've all been bought off. Some of them are given titles. You know, like in a church, everybody got a title. Everybody got a position. I'm head of this. I'm head of that. See, Tom know how to, and, and then Tom pay off. You know, he give a little donation here, give a little donation there, a little sandwich here, a little sandwich there. And that's how he does it. And uh, so... D-Bar, you're going to have a rough time, brother, because, you know, Tom got long pockets, and he got them Negroes running up and down the street saying how great it is. Check this out. Tom Cambrieri came to us and told us, if you elect me, I swear I'll get rid of uh, uh, Barlam. Now, here's Raymond Barlam, a man that was cited by the Ninth Judicial District for telling a damn lie to them. Now, Tom Barnes says, oh, it was just a question of semantics. That's not what them people say, not, that's not, not what his peers say, they say that he was willfully lying to them. Every judge that I talked to said, Barlam should have been disbarred. He should have been disbarred. Now, here we have the colonel goes before Barlam for a, a, a thing that happened on October 22nd where he, where the colonel called the police, Colonel Ronald Linton, called the police and the police didn't act in the way that he thought and he went up to the police station and up there were two thugs and a thugette which was Lisa Gallagher Montague and I believe Costa and they arrested the colonel for calling Montague a nigger and he was calling them all niggers and Montague you know, when you read this thing, he was so outraged that he was called, called a nigger. Now, here's a man that uh, 
according to some people, you know, sprayed and called some Puerto Ricans uh, spicks. So uh, they locked the colonel up, eight hours, buck naked, and a uh, 70 year old man now. Nobody's saying nothing. NAACPA said nothing. 70 year old black man. Colonel gets out. Last week he gets fined $150. Now here he gets fined $150, and Charlie Sherwood, and the woman talked to me, strips her. See, Sherwood is a, a former constable. Got the gas station up there on up from the police station. Stripped this woman and takes a coat hanger and beats her with a coat hanger. He didn't get no time. He didn't get no fine. Colonel gets a $150 fine. And, uh, well, what I want to do, I want to roll in because I got some guests that came because I was trying to wing it until they got here and I see that they're here. So I'm going to show you the... Uh, little brief program that we did for brother Chris Malone. We haven't forgotten you brother. I know your spirit is out there watching and uh, we know everybody deserves your mom. It's not everybody. Some of us have still got some integrity. So we're going to check this out and uh, thank all the brothers and sisters that came by later on that night when everything was over. You can edit this? Yeah, go ahead. And hey, uh, guys, Five, we finish this? You guys chill for a couple minutes? Please. So what I'm going to do, as you know, personally, on behalf of our, our uh, group, the Community Against Police Brutality, is just, you know, ladies flowers here and say we haven't forgotten the spirit of Chris. And in fact, we have uh, Brother Spencer Thomas, who uh, like to say a few words about the program, you know, he's going to have for uh, the other brothers and sisters along with Chris Malone. Now, you got to remember that when this brother included Chris Malone in his last tournament, the whole power structure came down on this black man. This is a young black man that turned out thousands of people in a basketball tournament. And the fact, for all you folks looking at it, they had an all-white group that came out here and beat the blacks. So you got to come down and check it out. See? Oh, yeah, um, we got the tournament going on the August 19th, which is Saturday. Um, if it rains, it's going to be August 20th, which is a Sunday. We have uh, a jump in air castle coming up. We also have some teams coming up with some uh, players that were featured on the TNT show on Hollow Ground from the Rucker Basketball Program. And um, we also have free cotton candy. And uh, uh, at 12 o'clock, we're going to have the kids, a kids tournament. And we got a girls team playing this year. Okay, the other thing is, is that um, I hope my brother Clay might say something, Clay Tiffany. Now here's a brother who survived attempted murder. Now a lot of people might laugh and say, you know, that's, you know, he just got beat. But this, we knew it was coming. The FBI knew it was coming. I don't think we knew it was coming that way, but with the tacit approval by the low life uh, le elected officials in Briarcliff. I mean, here you got a man that was attacked in Yonkers. Uh, beaten down with a gun put to his head. The FBI didn't do nothing. And then you had him uh, with, I believe, you know, support Tartaglia where they tried to murder him. And here you have this low life, Jadine Pirro, the same woman that said that uh, when Chris Malone was hit by these high velocity bullets, that the bullets hit him and went straight down in the ground while he was standing up. Now in the Diallo case, the pig said that when the nine millimeter bullet hits you, it goes straight through you. Now, if he was standing against the wall and they missed him about five times, how come there no bullet holes in the wall? How come the undertaker called me and say that there's some bullets in his back, in the back of his leg and in his back? So, what people haven't seen, and I want to tell you this, I was at a white family's house today in Montrose. They said that when they saw the picture of Clay Tiffany laying in that bed, that they started crying. They said that the only time they saw him was standing in front of the uh, TV and listening to what he was saying. But when they saw him laying in that bed, that they started crying. So we hope that when we have this um, meeting in the next three weeks, we hope that the brother will contribute his tape to us and people can actually see what these lowlifes, these thugs in blue, did to uh, brother uh, Tiffany. And I'm glad he won that. But hey, we're going to have a pork chop dinner or something, brother? Can you I say don't believe it? <laughs> Can you say a few Not words? for religious reasons. Can you say a few words, reasons. brother, before we uh, end this thing? Yeah, I think that the, a number of the police officers that were involved in this had a history of brutality, including De Benedictus, uh, James Montague, the Gallagher gal uh, had, had been accused of a 
by a family of, of brutality. Uh, De Benedictus and Dave Edwards had been accused by two Latino teenagers of calling them spick and pepper spraying them. Montague had uh, hit and killed Marissa Guido and he was not given a uh, alcohol test a few years back. Montague was also accused of uh, bad behavior as a cop. And uh, Tom Cambieri has to go. Apparently some guy named Don Debar is running for mayor, so... Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Yeah, we have other brothers that have come here to uh, pay their tribute to Chris. And like I said, this wasn't an advertising, it wasn't a big thing. We want to let the pigs know that we ain't forgot them. The spirit is still here, and we're going to be in court, and we're going to show that these cowards shot this brother in his back. Now, uh, I don't know if brother wanted to say something else before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Brother Spencer? Um, I just wanted to say, you know, the echo of Walter Brooks's comments that Chris Malone ain't been forgotten, he's still here. You know, at this tournament that we're having on the 19th of August, we want the people to come out. You know, we're going to uh, support a tournament of remembrance. We want the people to remember Chris Malone, Ali Holmes, Shauna Dancy, and we just want the community to know that Chris is not forgotten. All right? Thank you. Any brothers want to say anything before we plant these flowers, Brother Omar? I'd I just like to say that I'm here because I, there was a great injustice done. I believe that Mr. Malone was shot down like a dog. Been a big cover-up. Brother Sadiq, Lynn, Clay, Thornton, Mr. Thomas, a lot of people have been working hard. We need to have more input from the churches, from the community. People got to know it um, shouldn't be. If you sit down and just look at what's been happening through history, history will tell you. Why are we going to keep letting it go on and on and on? Okay. I just want to say I was up at Mrs. Malone's house today. I told her not to come down, basically, unless she wanted to. This is just something from us. We didn't advertise it with no stuff on the posters. It was just something that um, we just wanted to let the power structure know that uh, it's not forgotten. So what I'm going to do, brothers, is just leave this in behalf of the community. Long live the spirit. Walter, let me just say one thing about the colonel. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Before you do it. Yeah. Uh, there's a, there was a witness that, that has an affidavit in the federal case. Is, is an older gentleman named, he's, his nickname is the Colonel, his name is Ronald Linton. And Walter and I believe, and other people believe, that the Colonel has been f harassed by the police. I would hope that people would listen to my show and Walter's because we're going to apprise you of the next court hearings for the Colonel. He was fined a hundred... Okay, brothers and sisters, we're back, and um, you know, I'm going to show part of that in probably the next show. Uh, our guests have arrived, and uh, his brother Muhammad Sharif, who was on an East uh, Coast tour, and I'm glad to uh, have him here, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to Austin, my brother. I know they, uh, I heard you were stuck in traffic. Uh, um, you know, we were waiting for you, so I tried to wing it, so I guess I did a good job, and uh, let me move right ahead. Um, the East Coast tour, um, just let me ask you a question. Uh, in terms of Islam, you know, many of us thought that Islam was introduced to America um, by probably Honorable Elijah Muhammad at the time, because I know many of us came through the nation of Islam, and... Um, you know, after uh, Warathin Muhammad and uh, the rise of uh, African people here in America and Islam. But uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of history of uh, not only the impact of Islam on uh, black people here in um, America, but when we watched like Roots and stuff, we saw that black people actually came over on the slave ships yes. as Muslims. <coughs> well, first, the first encounter between Islam, uh, African Islam, and the New World was when the uh, the event of Mansa Musa becoming the king of Bali. Uh, we know the story when his uncle Abu Bakr sent some 200 ships into the west across the Atlantic and one of the ships made it back and said those ships had the ships ahead of him had gotten lost 
And then when that ship came back, he then loaded some 200 ships, and then he got on the boat and then went across. And according to Av Ivan Van Sutterman and other scholars, that those boats made it into the New World. So that was the first encounter of the New World with African Islam. And then, of course, uh, the first wave of slaves coming from uh, Guinea and from the areas of West Africa were uh, Muslims brought in by the Portuguese into Brazil. Can you stop just yes. there from a second, brother, because mm -hmm. I missed something very important, and yes. that is uh, you have a lot of qualifications down here that I really didn't tell the audience about yes. it. Maybe yeah. I can't read it all, but maybe you can just uh, tell us, you know, uh, yeah. some of the uh, schools you went to and the studies that Well, I studied uh, in Africa for some nine years. And I've studied in Sudan, in Mali, Chad, Nigeria, Niger. And uh, mainly what I do is I collect rare Arabic manuscripts written by mm -hmm. African scholars, books written on all uh, various subjects, uh, jurisprudence, history, uh, linguistics, books written by our scholars, some 200 years or more o old. And what we do is digitize those manuscripts and make them viable for the electronic mm -hmm. age now. Uh, and from that research is coming out this new understanding of history, a, rev a revision of, uh, of our history as well. Yeah. Uh, we also uncover Arabic manuscripts found in the United States, uh, in uh, South Carolina, Georgia, mm. as well as manuscripts that's been discovered in South America as well, that's written right. by this one homogeneous culture that came in from Africa. In fact, you can actually say that the only traditions that we can actually say anthropological evidence that we can touch with our hands that made it from Africa to the New World are the Arabic manuscripts. There are no Asantehini cloth, there are no Yoruba drums. Mm -hmm. The only thing we have that made it across that slaves did here in the New World were actually the Arabic manuscripts. So we're talking about an unbroken tradition among African uh, uh, ex-slaves bringing Islam into the New World. Right, I had interrupted <coughs> you. You were talking about uh, the impact of Islam yes. in, in Africa. Please. Okay, yes. Uh, getting back to the uh, the encounter after the the uh, the the emergence of Abu Bakr, his trip to the New World, and then the 15th century, no, we know that the Portuguese, of course, brought the sugar plantations into the New World, and they needed labor. And it was then that many Africans were brought into the New World to take care of that labor process. And the majority of the, new, the first wave of slaves were Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Brazil, we know of the, the, slave, the Muslim slave revolts that took place from 1807 all the way into 1837. In the Louisiana territories, we know of slave revolts led by men like Mohamedou Sambo in Natchez, Mississippi, uh, and also in, the, in New Orleans as well. We know of Fort Musa, which was uh, also a Muslim-led fort, for from 45 years held its independence along with the Seminole Indians in the Ever Everglades of Florida. 1812, during the American Revolutionary War, we have men like Mohamedou Bilali, who fought on the side of the Americans along with 81 other Muslims, and he also wrote his his document in Arabic called the Risala of Imam Abi Zaid, which is an actual a book on government from West Africa. He didn't write the Bill of Rights, he didn't write right. the Declaration of Independence. What he wrote was a document which was used as government in West Africa for some 11 centuries, which is Risala of Ibn Abi Zaid, and that book is still in the museums in, in Georgia. Uh, we have uh, men like Umar Ibn Said in North Carolina, who wrote his autobiography completely in Arabic. Uh, of course, at the time, it was a time when Africans, it was against the law for Africans to read or write. It was capital punishment if an African was caught reading or writing. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't allowed to read or write for many years, but eventually, once they discovered who he was, he then wrote down his memoirs in the one language that he knew, and that was Arabic language. And Arabic language was the lingua franca of West Africa for some 11 centuries. Right. And most of our language, whether it be Wolof, Hausa, uh, Mandink, um, uh, Fulbe, uh, most of these languages, in fact, even uh, 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 the Asantehini language was written in the Arabic script and let you know the power of that language, the literary language, and it was one of the uh, lingua francas of West Africa. And uh, again, b even uh, coming up to the 19th century, we have men like Mohammed Sati, a Sudanese brother, who did proselytization up and down the east coast of the United States, way before Elijah mm -hmm. Muhammad emerged. In fact, he went back to uh, El Azhar in Egypt, and he got a legal decision declaring uh, the, uh, the Moorish Science Temple as non-Muslims. So, okay. So Islam was here long before Elijah Muhammad, long before Farad Muhammad, and it had an African flavor to it because mm -hmm. the first Muslims here were, were, were African. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you know, at, uh, a few months ago we saw Skip Gates in, um, I don't know if you saw that yes, documentary, yeah, yeah. in Africa, and some <coughs> yes. of the things that you talked about in terms of looking at documents, yes. uh, Skip was talking about, but yes. uh, he was in Timbuktu, but 
Do you have an analysis of uh, you know what that whole thing was about? Um, well, uh, because the because a lot of people think it was the greatest thing they ever saw on TV. Of course. Well, the thing is, is that the anthropological data of Islamic Africa is so great that there's no way they can un they can cover it up because it's been covered. It's been covered up by mm -hmm. academia and by the intelligence community here in the United States. They have intentionally uh, overlooked and overshadowed the if Islamic presence in Africa and the Islamic presence in the United States. The reason being is because of the present day Muslim community are very volatile and they have political motives. And they will always have been afraid to reconnect this community, this present day community with their traditions because then they would have something to bite on in terms of the rights mm -hmm. of self-determination. So it's very, very clear that the, it, in order to release that information, it had to be colored through the eyes of either Anglo-Americans or uh, black, a black Anglos, right. African-Americans who basically capitulated over to Anglo-American culture. And so if people like Skip Gates can uh, 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 sift through and uh, portray our tradition through his own eyes, right. then it's still safe for the United States. Yeah. But it's very important for us not to be kind of deluded in that way. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think Harvard University has the right to hermetically seal <laughs> our Arabic manuscripts in, the, in their yeah, vaults. Right, right. These are our traditions. And of course, those traditions does, what, what, what it spells for us is that there is a tradition uh, which gives us the rights of self-determination. Self I think uh, the picture behind you, El Haj Malik Shabazz, had he had access to these manuscripts, of course, mm -hmm. his whole direction would have probably uh, changed and probably would have been uh, uh, pushed forward in terms of his is Islamic direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I think that's the thing that that's the thing that the danger that the government, as well as uh, many African Americans who are for some reason have decided to capitulate and assimilate into Anglo culture, they fear the growth of Islam among our people. Yes. Uh, the other question, because I, I know I saw here you spent some time in Sudan, and yes. um, the United States not too long ago bombed uh, Sudan, and um, in fact said that a uh, factory that, as I understood, was producing you know drugs and stuff for people's health. Yes. Um, can you uh, give us some kind of uh, analysis of that? Yes. Cause yes. And, and, and uh, you know, what is the big threat? that Sudan, Sudan yeah. gives to the United States. Well, you have to understand that Sudan is the largest uh, land mass country in Africa. It actually sit where it sits is actually acts as the heart of Africa because it, it is the, uh, the, the, the bridge between the Asian world and the African world, between the Arab world and the African world. Mm. It sits right there and two of the largest rivers pass through it, the White Nile and the Blue Nile. Africans for centuries, uh, since, the, uh, e uh, since the ninth century, have been traveling from West Africa, Takurur, uh, Nigeria, uh, Mali, crossing through Sudan to go to Mecca mm -hmm. and coming back from Mecca, and they would always settle. So in Sudan, you have Hausa, Fulani, you have all the West African tribes, and then you also have the Muslim tribes that come from the interior of Africa, like Congo, uh, uh, Malawi, who also travel through Sudan. So Sudan is extremely tr strategic in terms of influencing other African nations. Uh, of course, the United States uh, is threatened by uh, Islamic authority. Uh, they, they believe the United States and the West does not want to see a self-governing Islamic polity in anywhere in the world. If the Sudanese government could succeed and succeed successfully uh, in developing itself under the authority of Islam, of course, other nations like Algeria, uh, Nigeria, uh, Cameroon, which were at one time ruling themselves according to Islam, may opt mm -hmm. for that same option. So the United States' job, through its intelligence, is to keep Sudan destabilized, continue to uh, send out disinformation concerning mm -hmm. Sudan in terms of the question of slavery. Right, and of right. course, uh, this last embarrassment, which was really embarrassment for the United States because it showed that this intelligence department is not really intelligent. <laughs> right. Because if it was intelligent, then they would have known that 40% of the investment of that pharmaceutical was done by the UN. Mm. So to charge uh, Sudan with making uh, 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 biological weapons right. is to also charge the UN with financing uh, 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 pharmaceutical which, which makes uh, biological weapons. And of course Sudan did win the case in the world court and they did charge the United States. And the United States now has to reopen its embassy and has to re, uh, 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 I can I say, regulate its relationship between, uh, with Sudan. Yeah, well, uh, is there gonna be any kind of reparations for the, uh, or rebuilding of the, uh uh, the, so Sudan are, the, the Sudanese are very smart. They are, they are uh, biding their time, and they are seeing what type of precedents are in the world, and, uh, and they're slowly al aligning up uh, nations which at one time were 
on the side of America, on the side of Sudan. Uh, Canada, uh, China, many other nations have come in where America stepped back. Canada has come in because they've just found a huge uh, 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 deposits of oil. I'm talking about real good uh, right. petroleum in Sudan. Right. And since the Americans have, uh, have boycotted Sudan, the Canadians came in and now they're doing well. And the same thing with the Chinese. And so they're lining up these nations to mm -hmm. decide how they're going to deal with some form of uh, reparation, remuneration towards the Sudanese people. Because th the bombing of that ph pharmaceutical was not just disastrous to Sudanese people, because the pharmaceutical was being built to provide drugs that would fight typhoid and malaria, not only to Sudan, mm -hmm. but to all those nations in the region that cannot afford the high drugs and pharmaceuticals right, that the West right, produce. Right. So that was an act, an act of genocide. We don't know how far uh, the United States set back uh, the war against uh, disease in Africa mm -hmm. by the bombing of that pharmaceutical. And this is the thing that's going to that's, that scholars and scientists are actually assessing through that bombing. You see. Yeah, because um, I know Gore was uh, putting a lot of pressure on South Africa to accept the uh, you know the AIDS uh, treatments and the drugs that's from. Right. But if there was an independent uh, pharmaceutical like factory like of it was in Sudan, man, this would be real revolution. Of course, of yeah. course. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't know how many minutes we got, but the impact of Islam on black people here in America, I mean, no. maybe you're well, a of chronological... Uh, well, you're talking general. about uh, presently 300,000 uh, people, Af particularly African Americans, become Muslim every year. Mm. So by year 2035, we will be the second largest uh, religious minority in the United States. Uh, what that means politically and what that means economically and socially, uh, it, according to how you look at it, it could be devastating if you're an Anglo-American, <coughs> or it can be uh, uh, great. It could be great influence in terms of those who desire the rights for self-determination. Uh, this was our culture when we were brought here. Right. This is who we were. Uh, um, it is one of the most cohesive traditions in West Africa. What our high civilizations. You can't speak of high civilization in West Africa without mentioning. Timbuktu, or the Sankore University, yeah. or Yandoto, or, 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 or Kano, these ancient towns of learning where erudition was well known, where the gross national product throughout the empires of West Africa, whether it was Takru or Mali or Songhai, were books. It wasn't like gold or silver or weapons the way it is today, but it was actually li a, a literacy. And the way the person was up with mobile was through literacy. And that tradition is something that we brought here in, into the world. And let's face it, uh, the Islam has been kind to the U United States government. In fact, uh, Islam is the one element that can go into the prisons and take men who have basically given up, right. who the society defines as predators, including El Haj Malik Shabazz, men who had turned their back on uh, being, uh, how can I say, uh, what's the word, um, uh, 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 socially cohesive in the United States government, mm -hmm. who basically turned their back and went underground. Islam is going reaching for these men changing the, their hearts, changing their lives, giving this, them this vision of the next life, and making them human beings again. And as El Haj Malik Shabazz said long time ago, some 35 years ago, the government shouldn't uh, uh, investigate Islam. The government really should uh, invest and support the growth of Islam in the United States. Yeah, well, one of the things that I see happening, and I guess you know, many people see happening, is that uh, the criminalization of Muslims, you know, <coughs> For example, when you had the uh, bombing of the uh, place out in Oklahoma, yes. right away, you know, it was, it was, it was terrorists. That's you right. Know. That's right. Uh, you have uh, Jamil Al Alamin, of course. Abdul Al Amin down in uh, Georgia, um, now on trial for his life. Yes. And uh, I mean, here's a brother that took a community, turned it around, and right. there's no evidence that's right. that he had uh, shot these police that's officers. Right. But um, I don't, I don't see, you know, I. I I don't see this uh, support, I mean, unless it's coming and we just don't hear because we don't have the means of propaganda for the brother. Yes. I mean, he's one of our, you know, heroes. Man, yes. you know? I mean, he, in terms of his conversion and what he, he did in his uh, religious life, that's is right. like uh, historical. That's right. Yeah, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu always said, those who are good before Islam will be excellent after Islam. And uh, Imam Jamil al is a perfect example of that. He led the struggle mm -hmm. for our right, the rights of self-determination for our people before Islam. And when he became Muslim, his spirit was revolutionized. And now uh, he's continuing that struggle. 
And of course, this is nothing but a retake of the COINTELPRO attack upon our communities mm -hmm. and attack upon our leaders. This is a dry run to see what would our responses will be. Mm -hmm. Because yes, it's true. The African-American Muslim community are the most volatile element within the United States. We pose the one element in the United States that can and have the right to and possibly the, the will and the, 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 the will and the power to actually fight for our rights for self-determination in the United States. And I think that the arresting, arresting of J uh, Jamila Lamine is basically going to light that fuse, I believe. Okay. In terms of Islam in America, um, you know, I was at a meeting. I, I, in fact, it was a meeting to uh, support uh, Jamil, and uh, one of the sisters got up and spoke about the treatment of uh, women mm -hmm. in Islam, and she felt that this is an African sister. I don't know what state she was from, but I mean, she felt that uh, the brothers were um, more or less like still had that male chauvinism yes. in them. Yes. Um, no. You know, still some of the same basic problems you have using the Christian religion or yes, no yes. religion at all in terms yes. of relationship with the, with the women. But yes. how, do, how do you see that the role of women, yes. African women, here in the United States yes. in Islam? Well, one thing, it has to be understood that uh, three-fourths of the laws in the Quran deals with the rights of women. The problem where you find where women are oppressed in Islam is based upon ignorance, both the ignorance of the women mm -hmm. and the ignorance of the men that are oppressing them. Once a woman knows her rights in the Quran that Allah has given her in the Quran, then she can't be oppressed. Once men know that th they know the Quran itself and know the reason the verses have come down, there's no way they can oppress women. The whole essence of Islam, if you look at uh, the Arabian Peninsula before Prophet Muhammad came, the women were in a terrible situation. Mm -hmm. And then Allah revealed a book that would that slowly, slowly, over a 23-year uh, year period, began to free up women from the abuse that they were receiving before. Uh, you're talking about from bearing of women to the point where women now had uh, the same rights as men. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, once you find in a Muslim society where men are oppressing women, or where women are allowing themselves to be oppressed, is based upon ignorance. That means they don't know their book. And once yeah. they know their book, they know the Quran, they'll find that three-fourths of these laws were here basically to free them now. Yeah. Yes. Let me ask you, uh, where can brothers and sisters come out, some of the brothers and sisters that listen to the program, to hear you or uh, hear some of the knowledge that you've given us today? Is there a uh, local uh, masjid near? I've given uh, some lectures at the MIB, the Muslim, uh, um, uh, the Muslim uh, Islamic Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, and where am I going to uh, tonight? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to the Bronx at where? 177 yeah, 177 yeah. Mel Hope Place in the Bronx, yeah, no. Mount Hope in the Bronx, and then tomorrow is. So the you're not from Islam New York, though, huh? Well, I'm actually staying in London now. Uh, London, so in London, oh, yeah. England. Yeah, right. so, I was yeah. over there well, last July. Okay. And. Um, well, how is it? You, you have a, l a large Muslim community in, uh, in the uh, area? Well, uh, what I do is I'm the emir of a jamaat that's connected with uh, a leader in Africa. Okay, we're, we're just going to go off talking, so. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I'm their leader. So we have jamaats in Los Angeles, in uh, t uh, Tuskegee, Alabama, mm -hmm. and uh, here in New York area, uh, in Connecticut area, as well as uh, South Central area, and mm -hmm. Oakland, California, West Oakland, where the former right. Black Panther Party right, were, right. and right. Houston, Texas, and also in England as right. well. Let me ask you about uh, my brother Gaddafi. What we see here in America and as portrayed in newspapers almost every day is mm. he's some kind of like wild man and mm. um, fanatic. But wh what is his impact on the Islamic world? Uh, his impact upon the Islamic world has been uh, somewhat negative mm -hmm. because he's been responsible, like many leaders in North Africa, for killing many Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but as for is his support for liberation movements is known. He's, uh, he's mm -hmm. has supported liberation movements like the IRA and uh, other movements around uh, in mm -hmm. the United States as well as outside of the United States. But in terms of his relationship to Islam, it has been devastating. Hopefully, inshallah, he's not, he's not dead. Maybe he'll make Toba mm -hmm. and realign himself with the, act, the Muslim activists. But as so far, the history shows that he's his, his been very devastating towards the Muslim population in this country. The, the struggle by Muslims and uh, Soviet Union, what kind of impact has that made in the uh, Muslim world? Because I know some brothers that might have gone over there and helped, uh, yes. you know, as soon as they come back, man, they're tagged by the FBI, the FBI exactly. or something. Like that. What has that struggle meant? Because most people never thought that they would be there. I'm sorry. I was in the Soviet Union.